This is part 10 of the Manwa series titled Lips on Sword's Edge. If you haven't watched the previous parts, we recommend doing so for better understanding. Before we continue, we have a small request. Please subscribe to our channel. As only 20% of viewers who watch our videos actually subscribe, and your subscription helps keep us motivated. The Manwa continues with the Western delegation en route to the Northern Empire. Inside the carriage, the Crown Prince of the Western Empire, Lionel, expresses his excitement about meeting Anir to the Duke. The Duke responds, noting that it's been two months since Anir's wedding and how time afellies quickly. Lionel then asks the Duke if he doesn't plan to get married, to which the Duke replies that he prefers to remain alone. Just then, Juliana approaches the carriage and informs Lionel that they'll soon arrive there on an airship heading for the Northern Empire. Meanwhile, in the Northern Empire, it's the time of the Emperor's birthday. Inside the Imperial Castle, Cashin still couldn't meet the Emperor. The butler bows an apology, and Cashin remarks on how things are getting pretty hectic lately. Before leaving, he informs the butler that he will come back later. As Cashin was leaving the Imperial Castle, he heard a voice behind him calling him brother. Turning around, he saw Cynthia, the daughter of the Empress, approaching him with a smile. She expressed her joy at seeing him again, and questioned why he hadn't come to see her sooner, as she had been eagerly waiting to play with him. Cashin apologized to Cynthia, explaining that he had been busy with his duties. Cynthia reassured him, saying that it was all right because she could see him now. Just then, two knights approached, calling for Cynthia. Cashin noted how Cynthia's position remained unchanged. He informed the knights that he would be taking a walk with Princess Cynthia, much to her delight. Cynthia happily remarks Cashin to be the best brother as they set off together. Cynthia then remarks on how Cashin doesn't want to play with her because he's busy. With this, she expresses her desire to Cashin to quickly grow up and study hard to be close to him. As Cashin and Cynthia strolled in the garden, Cynthia brought up the topic of Cashin's wife and asked if she's beautiful. Cashin confirmed, and Cynthia's face lit up with joy. She then asked if his wife is prettier than her mom. Cashin replied affirmatively, saying that she's much prettier. Later, in the Terran Eugene mansion, Anor's nanny gave her an invitation letter to the Emperor's birthday. As Anor looked at it, she couldn't help but find it annoying. Just then, she noticed Cashin approaching her, realizing that his work at the Imperial Palace must have been completed. Cashin questioned her if she had taken her medicine today, to which Anor hesitated to reply. Suddenly, Anor's nanny intervened and reassured Cashin that she had made sure Anor drank the medicine three times a day, as he had instructed. In her mind, Anor thanked her nanny for her help. Cashin then asked Anur if she could accompany him for a moment. Anur replied affirmatively. Later, Anur and Cashin were on a boat, and Anur, delighted by the experience, mentioned to Cashin how romantic the tour was. Cashin expressed his relief that she liked it. Anur then mentioned that it was her first time on a boat like this. Cashin asked if there wasn't a boating lake in the Western Empire, to which she replied negatively. She then asked Cashin if he liked having trips like this, to which Cashin revealed that it was his first time riding a boat as well. Anur seemed puzzled upon hearing this. Cashin explained to her that many people had tried to drown him in the past, which made him wary of rivers. Anur silently looked at him for a while and assured Cashin not to worry, stating that if anyone tried to harm him in any way, she would kill them immediately. Cashin was taken aback upon hearing this and thought about how he didn't know if he should call it cute. But despite everything, he still found her cute. As the boat reached the other side of the shore, Cashin helped Anur step out of the boat. As they strolled through the market, Anur remarked on its festive atmosphere, and Cashin explained that it's to be expected since it's the Emperor's birthday eve. Anur suddenly blushed as Cashin took her hand and told her to come with him, as he wanted to show her something. Cashin and Anur arrived on a bridge, and suddenly multiple sky shots began to fill the night sky in different colors. Anur was mesmerized by the view, and Cashin informed her that this place had the best view. As they both enjoyed the sky shots together, Anur mentioned how beautiful it was. Suddenly, Cashin approached her and kissed Anur on her cheeks. Anur was shocked and blushing heavily. Cashin leaned in closer to her, and amidst the beautiful surrounding they both shared a sweet kiss together. The next day, the Western delegation arrived at the Imperial Palace and was greeted by Edward. Lionel introduced himself to Edward and extended his hand for a handshake, which Edward reciprocated. They both felt nervous in each other's presence, but still looked down on each other. Edward informed Lionel that his mother wasn't feeling well, 
so he came to pick them up instead. Lionel reassured him that it was fine. Edward then informed the delegation that he had prepared a villa for them, and suggested they leave their luggage there. He also proposed a tour of the Northern Empire, to which the Duke replied affirmatively, expressing gratitude for the special residence arrangements. The Duke mentioned that it might take some time for them to meet the Emperor of the Northern Empire, and suggested visiting the Terran Eugene mansion in the meantime. Lionel agreed to the suggestion. Later, as they arrived at the Terran Eugene mansion, Juliana tightly embraced Anor in excitement, and Lionel asked her how she was doing. Anor responded that she was fine and noted that he also seemed to be doing well. Lionel thought to himself that this place didn't suit his sister well, and he hoped she was truly fine. Awkwardly, Lionel mentioned that he couldn't believe his little sister got married and questioned how big of a man her husband must be to take her away from him. Juliana quickly intervened, cautioning Lionel to be careful of what he said and did. However, Lionel continued, stating that no matter how he thought about it, his sister's husband was the most unfortunate man in the world. Just then, Cashin arrived and welcomed the delegation, introducing himself to them. Both Juliana and Lionel were shocked to see him. In the heat of the moment, Lionel told Cashin that he was the most unfortunate man in the world. Juliana quickly stomped on Lionel's leg upon hearing this and apologized to Cashin for his rudeness. She then introduced herself to Cashin as Juliana Grain, a member of the Golden Dragon Knights, currently serving as a knight under the Crown Prince. Cashin reflected on her position as a member of the Golden Dragon Knights. Suddenly, Lionel extended his hand and introduced himself to Cashin as the Crown Prince of the Western Empire and Anor's younger cousin. He advised Cashin to freely call him brother-in-law. Cashin reciprocated the greetings by shaking his hand. The Duke then apologized to Cashin for the chaos, to which Cashin assured him that it was fine, as it made the environment lively after their arrival. As night fell, Juliana continued embracing Anor, who asked her to maintain some distance. However, Juliana replied that she didn't want to, because she missed her so much all this time. Juliana then remarked on how it was just as expected. Her leaders for arms were the best. Anor again told her to stop touching her. Juliana then asked Anor if she liked being here, to which Anor replied that it's not that bad. Upon hearing this, Juliana mentioned how she heard that the people of the Northern Empire really hated the people of the Western Empire. Anor remembered her previous tea party and how well the ladies treated her. She told Juliana that the people of the Western Empire are really great, almost overwhelming. Juliana was puzzled by this response. Juliana further questioned Anor if she liked her husband. Anor was startled by the sudden question, and Juliana explained that she was just curious. Anor replied that she didn't know yet, undeterred. Juliana persisted. Anor thought about how she thought she would get tired of Cashin, but it didn't seem like it. She smiled and questioned herself if it was because her husband was too good-looking. Juliana noticed Anor smiling and with a smile on her face called her. Anor questioned Juliana about why she was calling her so sweetly, sensing that something was fishy. Juliana asked Anor if she would like to make a bet for fun, prompting Anor to ask what kind of bet. Juliana responded by suggesting if she should seduce Cashin, would he fall for it or not? She proposed making it a bet. Anor flew into a rage upon hearing this, and Juliana was terrified by this. She bowed an apology in front of Anor, stating that she was just joking. Juliana then left the room and told Anor to rest. As she left, she mentioned that it was just a joke and that she never thought Anor would make such a face. Suddenly, she noticed Craven standing there, who told her not to be rude to their leader, as this was not the Western Empire. Juliana was silent upon hearing Craven's words, and she just stared at him for a while. She then asked him if he had ever seen her doing anything harmful to the leader. Craven responded, stating that she hadn't done anything particularly useful either. Juliana replied that it was according to his standards and asked if he knew why she quit the Golden Dragon Knight in the first place and became the prince's guardian knight. Craven showed his ignorance about such matters. Juliana revealed that the Golden Dragon Knight are all under the shadow of the leader, the Swordmaster. That's why she cannot help Anur with any external political attack, since they're all part of the same knighthood. She can't make any moves on her own because she's caught up in the argument. However, she stated that it's different for her now. Since she's the Guardian Knight of the Crown Prince, she can now help the leader any way she wants. She then turned to leave and told Craven not to try to lecture her arrogantly, as she's the person who cherishes Anor more than anyone else. 
As Juliana started to leave, Craven tried to stop her, but she wouldn't listen. Just then, we see Erica, who seemed to be eavesdropping on their conversation. She cried and wondered about Juliana's identity, believing herself to be the only one more loyal to Anor than anyone else. She wondered if Juliana was also friends with Craven. Deciding to check for herself, she approached Craven and questioned him about the woman's identity. Craven replied that her name is Juliana. Erica hesitantly tried to ask something, and Craven wondered if she heard his conversation with Juliana. Building up her courage, Erica questioned Craven if Juliana was his wife who was asking for a divorce. Craven was taken aback by the question and thought about how it's good that she's mistaken. The next day, as Anur and the godmother were going somewhere in the carriage, the godmother informed Anur that it's just an exchange meeting held before the emperor's official birthday party begins, so there is no need for her to get nervous. Anur agreed, but she reminisced about what Juliana had told her the last night, and her joke was still bothering her. Noticing her troubled expression, the godmother questioned Anur if something was troubling her, as she seemed uncomfortable. Anur reassured her that she's completely fine. As they arrived at the meeting place, Anur told herself to forget everything and wondered why Juliana's words were bothering her so much. She questioned if she was sick or something. Just then, Anur noticed Lillian and Daisy, who called her over. As they all sat down, Lillian asked Daisy if she heard that the victims of the slavery incident saved money to build a statue in the square for Craven, the hero of the Northern Empire. Daisy questioned Lillian if she donated too, as she had already done so. Lillian responded positively. Upon hearing all this, Anur mentioned how erecting a statue for Craven would make him really happy. Anur suddenly noticed something and asked Lillian and Daisy about the badges on their chests, as she felt like she's seeing them for the first time. Lillian revealed that this is a fan club member badge that she recently made. Anur asked for more clarification, and Lillian explained that it's a gathering called PA, which stands for Praising Anur Association. Anur wondered why they needed such an association. Daisy, noticing her expression, questioned Anur if they made her uncomfortable. Anur was silent upon hearing this, but she knew she couldn't break the dreams of these cute girls, so she told them that she's very happy. Just then, Empress Palcheria arrived at the meeting venue, and everyone bowed in respect to her. She thanked everyone for coming together for the tea party and informed them that she had prepared everything for them to enjoy comfortably. Suddenly, the Empress noticed Anur and remarked on how she thought Anur wouldn't come, but she actually showed up. Anur simply replied with a yes, which somehow made the Empress angry. The Empress then mentioned how Anur's cockiness was still the same as before. Anur didn't understand what the Empress was trying to say, so she just apologized to her. The Empress couldn't help but think about how Anur was so annoying. She then advised her that it would be good if she was careful about her words and attitude. Undeterred, Anur again replied with just a simple yes. Just then, a servant arrived and called the Empress, informing her that Princess Cynthia was nowhere to be found. This shocked the Empress, who suddenly ran away to find Cynthia. The other ladies began to discuss how a guard mentioned that accidents frequently happen with Cynthia, and how it turned out to be true. Another lady questioned if this meant that the princess didn't have the Emperor's favor. Just then, a maid arrived and apologized to all the ladies, informing them that today's tea party, due to unfortunate circumstances, would end here. The godmother suggested that they leave now, and she called for Anur. However, Anur advised them to leave first, as she would leave later. The godmother quickly agreed, realizing that Kashin might be coming to pick her up. As they all left, Anur reminisced about the time when the Empress got the news of the princess's disappearance and realized that the Empress was a person who could make that kind of worried face too. Later, as Anur was leaving the venue, Craven suddenly arrived and questioned Anur about why she came out so late, as he had been waiting for her outside for a long time. Anur replied that she just didn't want to come out first and questioned him about the whereabouts of Juliana. Craven revealed that she was currently on a mission and would be attending a social gathering held at the Crown Prince's palace. Upon hearing this, Anur realized that her uncle Sarno and Lionel must have gone as well. Suddenly, Anur and Craven heard rustling in the bushes, and a cute Cynthia emerged from it, announcing that she had arrived at the fairyland. Cynthia noticed Anur and declared her to be a fairy, questioning if she's a fairy princess of fairyland. She wondered about Anur's identity, as she looked so adorable. Cynthia got up and introduced herself as Cynthia, mentioning how she was going to fairyland and traveling on a slipper. 
Craven found her really cute, and Anur questioned if she wasn't the princess who disappeared. Craven asked Anur if they should contact the Empress's palace that they had found the princess, to which Anur responded that it would be a good idea. Cynthia became worried upon hearing this and shouted at them not to contact her mother, as she wouldn't go back. In response, Anur told Cynthia that she must go back. Cynthia pouted in anger. Just then, Craven intervened, stating to Cynthia that her mother must be really worried about her. Cynthia replied negatively, explaining that no one worries about her. She began to cry and told them that she wants to meet her brother. Anur wondered if she was talking about Kashin. She realized that it would be best to leave this matter to Kashin. She crouched down and told Cynthia not to cry, as this fairy would take her to her brother Kashin. Cynthia asked if Anur really meant it, to which Anur replied affirmatively. Craven, listening to all this from behind, was taken aback by Anur's sweet tone and fairy remark. He then asked Anur what she was planning to do, to which Anur simply smiled at him. Later that night, Anur arrived with Cynthia at the Terran Eugene mansion, and Cynthia happily approached Kashin upon seeing him. Kashin asked Anur if this was the reason. She told him to return to the mansion sooner, to which she replied affirmatively. She explained that she happened to run into the princess, but she didn't want to return to the Empress's palace, and she couldn't leave Cynthia behind, so she brought her to the mansion. Kashin told Anur that she did good, and he'll take care of the rest. Anur sighed in relief upon hearing this. Cynthia then whispered to Kashin, asking if Anur was the one he's talking about, the prettiest woman in the world. Anur blushed upon hearing this, and Kashin replied positively to Cynthia's question. Anur, embarrassed, covered her face. Later, as Anur was about to enter her room, Juliana called her from behind. Anur asked her if she had been to the Crown Prince's palace, but Juliana just smiled and asked Anur if she wanted her to share everything that happened at the palace, as she had brought champagne as well. As Juliana served Anur champagne, she revealed that she had beaten up a northern soldier because he said that female knights weren't allowed to enter the crown prince's palace. She further disclosed that when she entered the banquet hall, Edward, the crown prince, aggressively approached her and asked if there was something going on at the Terran Eugene mansion. When she asked for more clarification, Edward inquired about Anur's well-being. Upon hearing this, Anur questioned why the Crown Prince of the Northern Empire suddenly asked about her well-being. Juliana also mentioned how Edward seemed like a weird person because Anur is a married woman and his cousin's wife, yet he still did something like this. Juliana then revealed that there was also a knight from the Northern Empire who suddenly started picking a fight with her. Anur asked if she beat him up on the spot as well to which Juliana replied affirmatively. Anur remarked on how, in other words, she was making a fuss throughout the banquet. Juliana then told Anur that according to the information she got from the Crown Prince's palace yesterday, a tournament would be held soon to celebrate the Emperor's birthday. Anur questioned what kind of tournament it was, to which Juliana replied that the Northerners were secretly trying to discourage the other delegation. Juliana then questioned Anur if life in the Northern Empire was worth it. Anur asked Juliana if her father ordered her to come and keep an eye on her because he was afraid that she wouldn't return. Juliana replied in the affirmative, and questioned herself if she made it look too obvious. Anur thought about how her father worries about her too much. Juliana then stood up as the drink was empty, and told Anur to wait there for a while in the meantime, to which Anur agreed. Suddenly, Anur noticed the sky above her and found it really pretty, so she decided to go stargazing. Later, as Kashin was walking through a corridor, he suddenly noticed Anur walking oddly. Anur, completely drunk, questioned Kashin if he's that handsome, asking why he's so handsome and affectionate, while Kashin just smiled at her. Kashin then remarked to Anur that she seemed drunk. However, Anur told him that she's not drunk. Kashin leaned in and told her that normally drunk people always claim that they are not drunk, and asked her if she wanted him to put her to bed. Anur then asked why Kashin always smiles like that. Kashin asked for more clarification, and Anur clarified, stating that it's strange that he's smiling even though there's nothing particularly exciting happening here, as if he's putting on a mask. Kashin didn't say anything upon hearing this. She told him to try raising his eyebrows like she did and question how it's possible he's still handsome. Kashin just smiled at her and told her that he would take her to her chamber. Anur then mentioned how she wants to know more about him. She leaned in close to him and stated that she has a lot to protect and she can't possibly protect him too. That's why even though she doesn't have the right to, she just keeps getting greedy. 
She told him that she wants him and asked if he liked her. Kashin embraced Anur upon hearing this and admitted that he liked her very much, telling her to keep getting greedy like this. Anur questioned how this is even possible as she doesn't have much time left. We then learn about the Hall of Eternity, where the person chosen as an owner by the two swords shall inherit everything possessed by the first hero. Due to this rumor, many brave people gathered to test their luck. However, both Nevermore and Evermore are not easy to deal with. One day, young Anor came to find them with her uncle. Little Anor questioned her uncle about why they came here so suddenly. Her uncle told her that this is the place where the hero's peace sleeps. Suddenly, the ground started to shake, and both Nevermore and Evermore emerged in front of them. Nevermore questioned them if they came to forge a contract, and Evermore mentioned how, looking at both of them, it seems that only the child has formed no contract. As Evermore started to look into Anur's potential, she was shocked to find that Anur is an extremely talented person. Upon hearing this, Anur's uncle questioned her if he should just have her inherit his levitane. Both Nevermore and Evermore shouted that he can't, and both swords offered Anur to take them both with her. Just then, Anur woke up and realized that it was a dream. She wondered why she suddenly had this dream and questioned if she drank too much the last night. Just then, someone knocks on the door, and Anur allows the person to come in. Anur suddenly remembers what she did last night while she was drinking and realizes that it was not a dream. Kashin enters her room and informs her that he brought her honey water. Anur covers her face in embarrassment upon seeing him. Kashin then inquires if she slept well, to which Anur reveals that she didn't sleep well at all. She asked if he slept well, to which Kashin replied that he didn't sleep well either. As Anur began to sip the water, Kashin informed her that it's because someone dislikes his face, which caused her to cough. Kashin further revealed that that person said she doesn't like him smiling, so he put on a serious face, but she still didn't seem pleased. He mentions how he doesn't want to look like this either, and Anur apologized to him, which made Kashin chuckle. He then inquired if Anur remembered everything they talked about last night. Anur was shocked upon hearing this and asked if she drank too much. She tells him that she didn't remember the details, but she's really sorry if she said anything that hurt him. Kashin was silent upon hearing this and reminisced about what Anur had told her last night about not having time to stay. He wondered what that even means. Kashin asked Anur if she's really sorry. He then suddenly leaned in close to her, kissed her on the lips, and told her that it's her punishment. Meanwhile, we see Empress Palcheria in a carriage heading somewhere. She reflects on how the Emperor wanted a boy to replace the dumb Edward. He desired a legitimate son whom he could present as a new successor. That's why she married the Emperor, in hopes she could make it happen. However, instead, a girl was born from her womb, and the Emperor left in disappointment, no longer paying any attention to her and Cynthia. The words the Emperor spoke to her felt like he was delivering a verdict. He told her that her only purpose is to establish social discipline, advising her to not do anything else and live quietly. This meant her freedom as Empress was taken away. She endured and accepted the moment of humiliation just to have the right to raise Cynthia freely. She clenches her fist as she resolves to prevent the Emperor from using Cynthia as a victim of an arranged marriage in the future. She has no choice but to protect Cynthia, as she will never let her daughter live miserably like her. The scene then shifts to Terran Eugene Mansion, where Cynthia was playing with the hound. Craven remarked on how adorable Princess Cynthia is, and Anor's nanny also chimed in, stating that she felt like she's seeing Anor when she was young. Suddenly, Erica arrived and informed Anor that the Empress had come in person to take Princess Cynthia. Later, as Anur and the Empress sat down to enjoy tea, the Empress suddenly looked at Anur, making her wonder what was really going on. The Empress revealed that she received a letter from Kashin, stating that Cynthia was in Terran Eugene domain. She then thanked Anur for protecting Cynthia, to which Anur replied that it's not a problem. The Empress then called Cynthia over to her. Cynthia quickly approached Anur and called her sister. Realizing what was going on, Anur told Cynthia that her mother was worried, so she should go back to the Imperial Palace with her. However, Cynthia mentioned that she didn't want to go. Upon hearing this, the Empress questioned her about what she meant. Cynthia revealed that there's no one in the palace who doesn't fear her. Everyone is afraid of her, and people avoid her when she makes a mistake. She finally realized that she makes people go away from her. The Empress was shocked to hear this. 
Cynthia further told the Empress that she won't go with her, as she likes it here with Cashin. The Empress, upon hearing this, asked Cynthia if she even knows how much she was worried about her. However, Cynthia cut her off and stated that she never cared for her. She tells her that if she really cared for her, she would have never made her feel lonely. Cynthia asked her mother if she wasn't right, that her mother doesn't love her one bit. The Empress was really sad and started crying upon hearing this. Anor was in a dilemma of what she should do. Just then she noticed Craven and Erica from a distance, pleading to her to help the Empress for their sake. Anor then turned towards Cynthia and told her that she should hug her mother. She mentioned how Cynthia also likes her mother, and she didn't do that because she hated her. She also feels bad that she can't play with her. Anor then patted Cynthia's head and further mentioned how her mother must also be scared of the same thing. She's sure that her mother is scared that she can't express herself like this in front of Cynthia. That's why she should go and console her. Cynthia started to cry, and Anur reassured her that it's fine, as it was just a mistake. She's sure that her mother will forgive her. Cynthia then ran towards the Empress and embraced her. The Empress apologized to Cynthia, as she thought she was doing it for her. But little did she know, she would end up hurting her instead. The Empress further told Cynthia that in the future she will treat her a lot better. Suddenly, Anor noticed Cashin, who was standing a little distance away. He smiled at her, proud that she took care of this matter on her own. Anor, in response, also smiled cheerfully at him. After some days, the day of the Emperor's birthday banquet arrived. Inside the banquet hall, the Emperor expressed his gratitude to everyone who participated in the event and encouraged them to enjoy to their heart's extent. As other people attending the banquet began to congratulate the Emperor, someone called Anor from behind. As she turned to see who it was, she found Craven dressed in women's clothing. Anur questioned him about why he was dressing up like that, and Craven explained that he was in disguise so others would not recognize him. Anur asked him why he specifically needed to cross-dress, to which Craven replied that it was the most effective way. He also mentioned his bronze statue being built in the plaza, which prevented him from going outside with his bare face anymore. Craven assured Anur that he would still do his best to stay by her side. Just then, Lionel arrived and questioned Craven about his appearance, expressing disbelief that he was the vice commander of the Golden Dragon Knight's Order. Anur intervened, asking Lionel if he thought he was excluded from the situation. She pointed out that he had been walking around by himself since he was abandoned by Juliana, questioning if he considered this a dignified act befitting the future emperor. Craven then inquired about Juliana's whereabouts, and Lionel responded that he had no idea. He mentioned that she had something to take care of and went her own way. Meanwhile, Juliana greeted Cashin, and he wondered if she had another reason for coming aside from visiting as the Western Empire's delegation. Juliana insisted there was no other reason, and that she came solely to congratulate the Emperor on his birthday. Cashin fell silent for a moment before noting that she seemed more accustomed to politics than other knights who only knew how to swing their swords. Juliana asked if it was a compliment, and Cashin suggested there were many positions that suited her more than just being an escort knight. Juliana thanked him for his words. She then inquired about Cashin's marriage life, noting that despite her appearance, Anor seemed quite clueless about human relationships and could be dull in matters of romance. Cashin turned to leave, stating that since they no longer had business, it would be best to go back. Juliana then told Cashin that he was quite different from how she imagined him, causing Cashin to stop in his tracks. He asked her what she meant by that, and Juliana leaned closer, inquiring about what he thought of her. Cashin remarked that it was such an insincere thing to say, but Juliana just laughed, noting that he wasn't easily deceived. Cashin pointed out that it was obvious she was testing him and asked for his result. Juliana thought to herself that if Cashin had been even slightly swayed, he would not have passed, but she admitted that he passed with flying colors. She reflected on how it would be impossible for such a cold man to truly love someone, so Anur would naturally return to the Western Empire soon. She warned Cashin that if he ever hurt Lady Anur even a little bit, he should prepare for the consequences. When Cashin questioned why she respected Anur to such an extent, Juliana revealed that Anur was the person who changed her life, and she devoted herself to her. Cashin fell silent at this revelation, and Juliana bowed to him, informing him that she would be taking her leave now. Meanwhile, Edward questions Erzin if he thinks that his attire will suffice. 
To which Erzin replied in affirmative. Edward questions him if he really thinks that Lady Anor will look at him with this. Erzin replied that of course, as she wouldn't be able to look away however. In his mind he knew that Anor would probably won't even notice him. Edward then questions Erzin if he knows anything about the Western Empire's crown prince. To which Erzin responds by stating that he won't find another person who knows more about the Western Empire than him. Edward gets excited upon hearing this and tells him that in that case he had some questions for him. Erzin asked him what is he so curious about, and Edward asked him if he doesn't think he's better than Lionel. Erzin was shocked upon hearing this and just replied in a plain yes. Edward continues, stating that if Lionel becomes the emperor later, the Western Empire will surely fall into ruin. Erzin couldn't help but finds his words quite ironic. As Edward and Erzin left the room, Edward was surprised to encounter someone none other than Orsha, his fiance. She inquired about his hurried departure and whether he was avoiding her again. Edward denied it, taken aback by her assumption. Orsha mentions on how it's such a relief, as it's impossible for the crown prince to have any other thoughts than to keep his only fiancé company. Edward was taken aback upon hearing this. Erzin decided to make use of this moment and quickly escape. Meanwhile, Cashin finally found Anor and approached her. She asked if he had any plans for the day, noting his frequent presence in the banquet hall. Cashin questioned if she wanted him elsewhere, to which Anor clarified she didn't mean it that way. He then invited her to dance, causing whispers among the onlookers. Cashin reassured Anor to ignore them and focus on him. She replied that it was a banquet hall after all. Cashin suggested they move somewhere more private to escape the prying eyes. Anor remarks such a place didn't exist in the banquet hall, prompting Cashin to mention a spot often used by clandestine lovers. Anur reminisced about when Edward had taken her to the balcony, questioning the societal norms. Cashin gently placed Anur's hands on his cheeks, recalling her words from that night when she confessed her desires. He urged her to desire him more, to express her greed for him, and to assert her exclusive claim over him, promising to be solely hers. Suddenly, Cashin was interrupted by Lionel, who was shouting at someone. Lionel expressed disbelief that the man had the audacity to speak ill of his escort knight. The man attempted to calm Lionel, explaining there might have been a misunderstanding. Lionel demanded clarification, asking if the man hadn't just insulted his escort knight by implying his personal knights were more valuable. The man, with a smug demeanor, questioned if Lionel didn't think it could be true. Enraged, Lionel asserted that his escort knight was the most skilled in the Western Empire, hailing from the esteemed Golden Dragon Knight's order. The man argued that if his knights were to defeat Lionel's escort knight, it would prove their superiority. Cashin intervened, urging them to settle their dispute through a fair duel in the tournament. Both parties agreed. The Duke thanked Cashin for his intervention, acknowledging it couldn't have been easy. Cashin humbly replied that he simply did what was necessary. Meanwhile, as Anor observed the scene from a distance, Erzin suddenly called out to her from behind, remarking on how it had been a long time since they last saw each other. Anor acknowledged his greeting and mentioned hearing rumors about his close association with the crown prince. Erzin explained it was merely for political connections. He then suggested they move somewhere else for a private conversation. Anur, curious but cautious, questioned what he wanted to discuss. Erzin hesitated emphasizing the importance of the topic. After some hesitation, Anor finally agreed to accompany him. Once outside, Erzin questions Anor if it isn't about time for her to wrap up her life in the Northern Empire. Anor replies in the positive, and Erzin reassures her not to worry, as everything will be solved smoothly. He reveals that he's here to ensure it happens that way after all. Anur feels perplexed now that she's been reminded of reality. Erzin then calls Anur and takes her hand, contemplating that if he doesn't say what he wants to now, his gut tells him he won't be able to grab Anur's attention anymore. Anur questions Erzin about his intentions, to which Erzin admits he likes her a lot, confessing he's been yearning for her all this time. Anur questions if he even knows what he's saying, but Erzin explains he planned to wait until she could accept his feelings. However, she got married in the meantime, and he never accepted that outcome. Anur withdraws her hand, reminding him she's a married woman and to not cross the line. Erzin retorts that he was the first one to meet her and the first to like her. Anur again reminds him she's married, but Erzin questions if she wasn't going to get a divorce from Kashin. As Anur tries to respond, she suddenly halts, wondering why she's hesitating and why Kashin's thought crosses her mind. 
Erzin then tells Anur that he wasn't asking her to give him an answer. He was just expressing his feelings as he couldn't bear to hide them anymore. He further mentions that if she tells him she really likes Kashin, he will not act this way in the future. However, if she doesn't feel anything for him, he will always be waiting for her, even if it takes months or years. He asks her to please give him a chance as well. As Anur was about to respond, Kashin suddenly arrives and remarks that it's as expected. He can't just stay here and overlook this matter. He approaches Anur and takes her away from Erzin. Kashin accuses Erzin of taking advantage of his absence and dragging Anur out here. He tells Erzin to get away from his wife this instant. Erzin replies, mentioning how Kashin really has a foul hobby of eavesdropping on others' conversations. As the situation was about to escalate further, Anur intervenes, stopping both of them, to which Erzin agrees and tells her he will be taking his leave now. As Erzin leaves, he thinks about how Anur seems confused when it comes to leaving Kashin. However, he realizes that if he hadn't said that earlier, maybe there would have been no other chance for him to confess his feelings to her. We then learn about Erzin's past. His father has never seen him or treated him as anything more than an expendable item, solely existing for his older brother, who is the son of his first wife. Erzin, born from a different mother, grew up with his older brother's noticeable wariness of his existence, as Erzin was reluctant to share the county's assets with him. Realizing this, Erzin volunteered himself as a participant in an unfavorable war, hoping to die with honor. However, during a fight, an enemy soldier was about to kill him when Anur suddenly intervened and saved his life. She told him that if he truly wished to die, he should do it out of her sight, as it's unpleasant to witness someone familiar dying before her. Despite the never-ending conflict, everyone on the battlefield was fighting not to lose. Anur advised him not to waste his life recklessly. Erzin questioned what she was fighting so fiercely to protect, to which Anur replied, her family, her subordinates, and the Western Empire. This shocked Erzin. Upon hearing her words, his thoughts of wanting to die vanished. It didn't matter to him if it was admiration or any other emotion. He just couldn't take his eyes off her. He questioned when he became like this, only to realize it was since the first time he saw her. Just then, a red-haired woman stands in front of Erzin. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to Anur and Kashin. Anur wonders what she's supposed to do now as Kashin calls her and asks if she has feelings for Erzin. Shocked, Anur wonders why he would even ask her that. Kashin further questions if she's having an affair. Anur replies by stating she would never do something so indecent. Kashin suddenly leans in towards Anur, and she thinks how unfair it is as Kashin is way too handsome. He tells Anur that if she doesn't want him, she should push him away instantly. Suddenly, he kisses her on the lips, and Anur wonders since when did she get used to all this. The next day, at the Terran Eugene mansion, Duke informs Anur that they are returning to the palace. Lionel tells her they'll see her later, and Anur replies that the tournament is not far away, so she will meet them there. Just then, Erica arrives and informs Anur that all the luggage has been placed in the carriage as per her command. As they were about to leave, Erica calls Juliana and informs her that Sir Craven would like to have a word with her. Juliana is shocked upon hearing this, and the Duke tells her to take her time. As Erica shows the way to her, Juliana questions why Craven couldn't just come to her. After walking a little distance, Erica suddenly halts, and Juliana questions her about Craven's whereabouts. Erica then turns and reveals to Juliana that she knows her secret. Juliana is jolted upon hearing this and questions Erica about what she's talking about. She wonders what Erica knows and if she found out about her secret mission to bring Anor back to the Northern Empire. Juliana realizes she must get rid of Erica if she can't convince her. She questions Erica about what she knows, and Erica responds by questioning if she and Craven are married. Juliana is taken aback upon hearing this, replying that she is single and doesn't believe in marriage, mentioning how Craven is also unmarried. Erica is shocked and inquires if she's telling the truth, to which Juliana replies affirmatively. Erica sighs in relief as she realizes Craven wasn't lying to her. However, she suddenly tosses her head as she realizes that back then, he wasn't talking about himself but Lady Anur's divorce with the Archduke. Meanwhile, as Craven sits with Anur, he inquires if Juliana left the mansion, to which Anur confirms. As she sips her tea, Erica suddenly arrives and tells Anur that she knows everything. Anur questions what Erica knows, to which Erica angrily glares at Craven and reveals that Anur was thinking of getting a divorce. 
Both Anur and Craven are shocked upon hearing this. Anur thinks to herself how she thought she had settled this matter already. Erica then tells Anur that she couldn't care less, which surprises Anur. Erica asks Anur to take her to the Western Empire with her, as she doesn't care what she does as long as she can serve her forever. Anur silently looks at her for a while, then nods in agreement, making Erica happy. Just then, Alan, who was shocked after hearing Erica's words, suddenly turns and thinks about who would have thought that Lady Anur was planning to get a divorce. He realizes he needs to immediately inform Cashin about this. Meanwhile, Cashin, in his office, is conversing with the Emperor of the Northern Empire. The Emperor mentions how it's been a long time since they last talked, to which Cashin replies that it's indeed been a long time because he had been avoiding contact with him. The Emperor tells him that it's not true, as he was just busy with his work, that's all. The Emperor then asks Cashin why he informed the Eastern Kingdom that a Western Swordmaster is missing. Cashin responds by questioning if it even matters as Anur is not a sword master anymore. In his mind, he knows that if he hadn't done this, the Emperor would not have talked to him otherwise. The Emperor apologizes to Kashin for keeping Anur's identity hidden from him and reassures him that it will never happen again. He advises Kashin to please be more careful with confidential information in the future. Kashin then admits that he took things a little too far as well. The Emperor tells Kashin that they'll revisit this discussion another time, as he must settle the mess he has created, to which Kashin agrees. Just then, Alan arrives and informs Kashin that there is something he must inform him about. Kashin questions what's the matter, and Alan reveals that His Highness Anur seems to be thinking about getting a divorce. Kashin's heart sinks into a river of sadness and anxiety upon hearing this. Meanwhile, a man asked his servants if it was true that the Western Swordmaster was missing because she got married. The servants confirmed it, and the man sighed, speaking aloud that he can never forget that woman who pushed him into the depths of despair. He vowed to show her what true hell looks like. It turned out he was George Frigman, the general of the Union of the Eastern Kingdom's Lost War. The next day, Anur's mother inquired if she was having a good time. Confused, Anur asked for clarification. The Duchess revealed that she knew her daughter was concerned about something. Anur admitted that people will hate her if she returned to the Western Empire without giving them any answers. She can't figure out what she's feeling right now either. It feels like she's betraying Cassian somehow, and it's making it hard for her to leave him here all alone, despite knowing that he has no one on his side other than her. The Duchess reassured Anur that she could do whatever she wished, and that she didn't have to get a divorce if she didn't want to. She encouraged Anur to follow her heart. Time passes quickly from day to night, and Anur still couldn't meet Cassian. Alan arrived and informed her that His Highness would be late tonight due to some unexpected work. When Anur inquired about the reason, Alan simply said that Cassian was busy with his duties. Anur felt a wave of disappointment upon hearing this. Sensing her mood, Alan spoke up, saying he was glad she had come to this manor. Curious, Anur asked for more clarification. Alan explained that Cassian usually didn't open up to others, but it was different with her. He believed that perhaps an upright person like Anur could make Cassian's heart shine again. In the middle of the night, Anur remained awake, anxiously waiting for Cassian to return. She wondered what could be taking him so long, and if it was always this difficult to wait for someone. Suddenly, she heard footsteps. Looking out the window, she was shocked by what she saw. Grabbing an umbrella, she quickly made her way outside the mansion. Erica tried to stop her, but Craven intervened, advising Erica to stay out of it, as it was none other than Cassian, standing in the rain, looking heartbroken. Anur felt a pang in her heart, wondering why Cassian seemed so distant and why it hurt so much to see him like this. She approached him and asked why he was standing in the rain and if something bad happened. Cassian, with a pained expression, told her that it was all her fault. Confused, Anur asked for more clarification. Cassian explained that everything had always been easy for him. There was nothing in the world he couldn't have. It had always been effortless to make anyone fall for him, and he had never struggled to win someone's love. But with her, it was different. He didn't understand why it was so difficult. He pleaded, asking what he could do to win her over. Suddenly, Cassian leaned closer to her. His voice was intense as he instructed her to push him away if she didn't want this, because he was going to go all the way with her tonight. Inside the room, Cassian began to kiss Anur on her lips. 
She tried to stop him, but he told her to consider this a payback for what she had done to him. He confessed that he couldn't control himself anymore and warned that she might get hurt. Blushing, Anur told him that it was all right. The next morning, Anur woke up to find Cassian sleeping peacefully beside her. She blushed and wondered if they had really done the deed last night. What she had initially thought would be a short acquaintance was becoming something much deeper. As she lay there, she realized that perhaps it was all right to open her heart to him after all. Anur finally expressed that she liked Cassian and wanted to spend more time with him. Just then, Cassian grabbed her hand, causing her to flinch in shock. She inquired if he was already awake. Cassian replied affirmatively, stating that he had been conscious for a while. Anur further asked if he had heard everything she said. Cassian responded that it was like music to his ears. Cassian then asked if there was something she was still not telling him. Shocked, Anur quickly got up and apologized to him. Cassian leaned in close and assured her that it was fine if she didn't want to tell him. Yet he told her to use him in any way she wished, as long as she stayed by his side, because he couldn't live without her anymore. He kissed her and pleaded with her not to leave him. The scene shifts to the border between the Western Empire and the Union of the Eastern Kingdoms. A soldier wonders aloud if Anur is going to be all right. Another soldier chimes in, mentioning that she might be enjoying herself because it has only been a few months since she got married. The first soldier replies that it's the few months part that worries him the most. The second soldier asks for more clarification, and the first soldier explains that the Union of the Eastern Kingdoms has apparently found out about Anur's presence. Since they are at the border, they would be the first to die if the other fallen kingdom attacks. He adds that it's only because of Anur's presence that the Golden Dragon Knight is well known, and if she doesn't return, then the Western Empire could be in deep trouble. The second soldier assures him that they still have Den. The first soldier replies that Den is another problem. The knight believes that this Den person has sensed something as well, and it's only because the emperor ordered them not to disclose Anur's presence to him. Just then, the soldier notices his buddy has fallen. Before he can react, a guy puts a dagger to his neck and asks why the emperor would hide the fact that Anur is in the Northern Empire from him. It turns out the man is none other than Den himself. Den was a war weapon of a foreign nation who spent all his days on bloody battlefields, devoid of any emotions and morals. His life consisted of nothing but murders. However, one day, he met Anure on the battlefield, and she thrashed him easily. After that, everyone argued that he must be executed once the war was over, but Anur saved him. Thanks to her, he was able to join the Golden Dragon Knight's order. However, because he was feared by all, he struggled to fit in within the order. One day, he expressed his desire to Anur that he wanted to be stationed at the border. Anur asked him why, noting that the place didn't even have a village, and there was no telling when something dangerous might break out. Den reassured her that he would be fine, and also asked her to visit him frequently when he was there, to which Anur agreed. In the present, the soldier revealed to Den that Anur got married and was currently living in the Northern Empire. Upon hearing this, Den realized that he must head to the Northern Empire at once. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to the Colosseum of the Northern Empire, where trials for a swordsmanship competition are taking place in celebration of the Emperor's birthday. Craven asks Anur if she heard that the Emperor will grant any wish to the winner. Anur, however, she just avoids him, like my crush avoids my texts. What the fuck? Hey you dumb fuck editor, haven't I told you not to write my personal details in the script? She happily waves at Cassian, and witnessing this, Craven inquires if she really loves Cassian to which she replies affirmatively. Craven is so shocked that he begins to cry out, remarking that he's really jealous of her and that he's also going to find a lover. Anur wishes him the best of luck. Just then, Juliana makes her appearance in the Colosseum. She's the first Westerner in the history of the Northern Empire to have ever stepped into the Colosseum. Her opponent arrives and tries to instigate her by mocking and looking down on her. In reply, Juliana asks who he is again Taken aback, he reminds her that they met last time at the Crown Prince's palace. On remembering who he was, she asks if he came to receive the rest of the beating. Enraged, the man grits his teeth and mentions how it seems she doesn't value her life at all. In response, Juliana unsheathes her sword 
and tells him that she won't be so forgiving this time. We then see a scene from the past where Juliana's father slapped her, insisting that a lady's role is to be obedient and get married. He believed that the family's secret swordsmanship could only be passed down to men and forced her to take bridal lessons for the purpose of bearing a son. Whenever she refused to follow his orders, he physically abused her. Every day was so painful that she wished for death. One day, however, her father returned home badly injured. When Juliana asked her mother what had happened, her mother revealed that he had been humiliated in a duel by a new female knight who had joined the order that day. Juliana was shocked. The next day, Juliana visited the order and saw Anur defeating a male knight with ease. Anur then turned to the other knights, asking if anyone else had an issue with her being a knight. Juliana felt a sudden and intense feeling of joy upon seeing Anur defeat a man. This was the first time Juliana met Anur, and it was the moment her life changed forever. Meanwhile, in the present, Juliana quickly gets in the position and attacks the guy. He is completely shocked by her brute strength. Before he could do anything, she smacked his sword and won the match just like that, allowing her to proceed to the finale. Thessalaka then notices the Cassian smiling, and as it turns out all of his attention is focused on Anur, he asks him if he really had fallen for her, to which he agreed this time. And Cassian then inquired to him about why he came here? Thessalaka revealed that he was investigating the crime from the last month and found something suspicious. He revealed that there is always a higher up when it comes to human trafficking organization, but he can't find anything this time around. He believes that there should be an account book or some form of a trace if they sold slaves, but there aren't any records at all, Cassian replied by stating that it's definitely concerning. Just then, Rashalis arrived and informed Cassian that Prince McKinsey is on his way to the capital. The scene then shifts to delegation, where a man questions his knights if everything is going as planned. The knights reply in affirmative. The man further questions his knight, how's Cassian? The knight revealed that they haven't been able to get in contact with him. Shocked, the man questions the knight if he's suggesting that Cassian had forsaken them. The knights replied in negative, explaining that he heard that Cassian was madly in love with the Grand Duchess. The man completely taken aback upon hearing this. As it turned out, the man was none other than Mackenzie. Meanwhile, at the Imperial Palace of the Northern Empire, the butler informed the emperor that Mackenzie is on his way to the capital and has dealt with the remaining traitors as commanded. The emperor then inquired if Cassian had made any moves. The butler replied that there had been no updates regarding Cassian. The emperor further asked if this meant Cassian hadn't been involved in any way with Edward or Mackenzie. The butler responded by stating that Cassian hadn't contacted them recently. From what he heard, Cassian has been distracted by his love for the Grand Duchess. Suddenly, the emperor began to shout, insisting that wasn't possible. He was sure Cassian had something up his sleeve and wondered what he was scheming this time. The butler then noticed two people sitting in front of the emperor. One of them remarked on how everyone had been talking about a western female knight who defeated a northern knight and made it to the finals. The emperor gritted his teeth upon hearing this. Sensing his anger, the man told the emperor not to worry, as he already had a plan. There was no way a western female knight would win the competition, as they were there precisely to prevent that. Meanwhile, at the Terran Eugene mansion, Mackenzie had already arrived to meet Cassian. Cassian asked him why he came, as he heard Mackenzie was on his way to the Imperial Palace. Mackenzie replied that he was returning from eradicating the traitors who supported the previous emperor. Cassian wondered how those who supported the previous emperor could be considered traitors. Mackenzie then revealed that he came back because he was informed that a red-eyed man was causing a commotion near the southwestern borders. Upon hearing this, Cassian inquired about the age of the man. Mackenzie replied that he was younger than him. Realizing this, Cassian understood it wasn't Anur or her uncle, the swordmaster. Later, as Mackenzie began to leave, Cassian called out to him and asked if there was something else he wished to say. Mackenzie replied that there wasn't anything else, and Cassian sighed and let him go. Meanwhile, Anur is conversing with Juliana, congratulating her on making it to the finale. Oh. Juliana, seeking more praise, asks Anur to compliment her further, but Anur responds that she will if Juliana wins the finals. Just then, Anur's nanny enters the room and informs her that the carriage has been prepared. Juliana, curious, 
asks where Anur is going, to which Anur reveals that she is going on a date. Juliana is shocked to see Anur with such a lovely expression for the first time. After disconnecting the magic ball, Juliana wonders what will happen if Anur doesn't return to the Western Empire, realizing that it would be a huge problem for them if she doesn't. Later, as Anur is casually strolling with Cassian in the market, she suddenly remembers that it has been more than three months since she came to the Western Empire. Reflecting on her mother's advice, she realizes she should just listen to her. Cassian then takes Anure to an ice cream shop that has been in the Northern Empire for over 60 years. As Anure takes a bite of the ice cream, she finds it delicious and asks Cassian if he would like some too. Cassian notices crumbs of ice cream near Anure's lips, and he leans close to her, licking the ice cream, causing Anure to blush profusely. Suddenly, Anure notices a bandaged man behind Cassian, the same man who had been watching her during the cave incident. She wonders what in the fucking world is he doing here. Anur felt a sense of unease, suspecting the bandaged man was up to something bad. She considered following him, but before she could act, Cassian called her and asked if everything was all right. Just then, Anur realized the bandaged man's aura had disappeared. She told Cassian it was nothing and mentioned noticing a small theater last time, suggesting they go there. Cassian intervened, advising Anur not to shoulder everything by herself, and reminding her that she could lean on him. Anur nodded in agreement. Uh, meanwhile, at the Imperial Palace, Mackenzie reported to the Emperor that he had completed all the missions assigned to him. The Emperor remarked on how long it took. Mackenzie explained that he hadn't expected so many pests needing extermination. The Emperor then inquired if any had escaped. Mackenzie assured him that he believed all were taken care of. The Emperor began to yell, accusing Mackenzie of never completing tasks perfectly. Mackenzie apologized for any inconvenience. The Emperor then asked if Mackenzie had heard about the trouble at the southwest borders. Mackenzie replied affirmatively. The Emperor questioned why he wasn't there dealing with it. Mackenzie started to explain that he had just returned, but the Emperor cut him off, calling him unworthy of being his son and instructing him to leave at once for the southwest border. Gritting his teeth, Mackenzie agreed to leave immediately. Meanwhile, at the banquet hall, the ladies couldn't help but praise Juliana for making it into the finale with such ease. Suddenly, a red-haired lady named Haley entered the banquet hall, accompanied by Rosanna. However, everyone seemed to avoid her. Rosanna told Haley to ignore these people, remarking how they used to suck up to her, but are now obsessed with the Grand Duchess. Haley abruptly shouted at Rosanna that it's enough. She knew it very well. Rosanna was also using her to elevate her own status. As it turned out, just before arriving at the banquet, Haley had met with the emperor. He told her that they both wanted the Grand Duchess position to be vacant and promised to place her in that role, granting her whatever she desired. However, to achieve this, they first needed to get rid of Anur. In the present, Cassian arrived at the banquet, and Haley greeted him, asking if he missed her. Cassian responded by asking if she missed him, to which she replied that she missed him a lot. Just then, Anur intervened, questioning what they were talking about. Cassian replied that he was just greeting an old acquaintance, which shocked Haley. Anur pouted and averted her gaze from Cassian, who asked if she was jealous. Anur denied it. Witnessing their exchange from afar, Haley wondered if Cassian was the same man she used to know, as she never realized he was capable of smiling like that. Before pursuing the jealous Anur, Cassian turned to Haley and told her that people always use her because she seeks things that are out of her league. Haley was completely taken aback by his words. How he then turned and began to leave, while Haley clenched her fist in annoyance, thinking that he cannot protect that woman all the time. Haley then told Rosanna that she needed some time alone, to which Rosanna obliged. As she moved away from the scene, Rochalis observed everything from behind with a serious expression. Outside the banquet hall, Craven asked Anur if she was jealous just now. Anur was shocked upon hearing this. Craven continued, saying she had been surprising him every day, making him realize she was human too. He then revealed to Anur that Ergen advised her not to get involved if something happened. Anur asked for more clarification and Craven explained that he didn't know the details, but Ergen told him not to be shocked 
even if the castle walls were destroyed. Taken aback by this revelation, Anur retorted that anyone who saw the castle walls get destroyed would be shocked. She instructed Craven to reveal everything to her. Craven replied that Ergen had told him about the current political situation, but he had forgotten the details. Anir thought about how Ergen would have written to her if he wanted to provide an update, but the fact that he delivered the message through Craven meant he was actively avoiding her since that day. Anir then turned to Craven and ordered him to go back and find out exactly what Ergen said. Once alone, Anir realized that something was definitely wrong. She wondered if it had something to do with the bandaged man she saw last time. Just then, Rashalis arrived and asked Anir for a private conversation. Meanwhile, inside the banquet hall, Haley was aggressively gulping down her wine, clearly angry at Anur for making an arrogant face towards her. Just then, a lady approached Haley from behind and apologized for the delay, explaining that the ingredients Haley had requested were difficult to find, but that she had managed to locate most of them. She told Haley to personally pick up the last ingredient at the promised location tomorrow. Excited, Haley agreed, stating that there wouldn't be any issue. On the other hand, Edward was conversing with Lionel, who couldn't care less about the conversation and just want to return to the Western Empire. Suddenly, Edward brought up the topic of Anur and asked how she was as a child, expressing that he believed she was adorable. Taken aback, Lionel asked for more clarification. Recalling his past with Anur, he wondered if Edward truly found his monster-like sister cute. He then asked why Edward liked his cousin so much. Edward replied that it's obvious. It's because she's the most stunning lady in the entire world. Yup, he lost him. Meanwhile, outside the banquet hall, Anur asked Rashalis what he wished to discuss with her. Rashalis replied that he knew it wasn't his place to say this and sought her forgiveness in advance. He then knelt in front of her and pleaded with her to part ways with Cassian. The next day, early in the morning, Haley was taking Rosanna somewhere. When Rosanna asked if they should be heading to the stadium, Haley told her not to worry. Undeterred, Rosanna mentioned that she really didn't like this place, finding it dark and creepy. Haley suddenly turned and asked Rosanna if she really saw her as a best friend. When Rosanna replied positively, Haley further asked if she would come with her, to which Rosanna hesitantly agreed. Haley thanked her for her consideration. Later, at the Colosseum, Cassian told Anur that many people wished to speak with him since it was the last day of the festival. Anur told him that it was all right. As Cassian left with Alan, Craven revealed to Anur that he had been looking for Ergen the other day and found him at the southwest border for some reason. He asked her what could be the reason, but Anur seemed a little off. She reminisced about what Rashalis had told her, that Cassian was destined to lead a great cause regardless of his will, yet he continued to start new things when that great cause was right around the corner. Rashalis did not wish to see a plan that Cassian had worked on his entire life crumble and begged her to part ways with his lord. In the present, Anur was daydreaming when Craven called her. He asked why she seemed so distracted today. Anur's expression suddenly turned sad as she wondered if it was even possible to break up with Cassian after everything. They were too close now. After some time, just before the match was about to begin, Juliana officially made her appearance, causing all the ladies in the crowd to go wild. Her opponent, known as the pride of the Northern Empire and famous for never having lost a competition, also made his appearance. The man told Juliana to forfeit the match if she wanted to save her life. Juliana replied by asking if it was part of Northern culture to use their opponent's life as a bargaining chip, which deeply angered the man. Juliana then advised him to stop chattering like a little girl and just fight her, confidently stating that she would defeat him in five minutes. Meanwhile, the doctor entered the Colosseum with a dark aura surrounding her. Entities from that aura asked the lady to let them out, as they wanted to consume darkened souls. However, the doctor told them to be patient, as she needed a bit more time. Excellent ingredients hardly ever came to her willingly, and she believed that today was going to be an excellent day. Meanwhile, outside the Colosseum, the leader asked his knights if they had surveilled the west side as well. One of the knights revealed that they had sent some men there, but they hadn't returned yet. The leader told his knights to get their act together while he went to check it out himself. Before leaving, a knight asked who he thought would win today. The leader confidently asserted that since the challenger was a woman, 
he thought Sir X would beat her right away. Suddenly, he heard a noise and thought he had stepped on something. On the other hand, the match had already begun. X asked Juliana if she was afraid as her movements seemed rather sloppy. Juliana smiled and quickly pushed him away, stating that he talked too much for his size. As she jumped for a direct hit, a sudden explosion occurred a little distance away from the arena's ground. Anur was shocked to see this and inquired with Craven about what was going on. Craven believed that it was some kind of planned terrorism, not an accident, and advised her to quickly get out of there. Anur responded by questioning why she should run away. Craven replied that this matter didn't concern the Western Empire, that it was something the Northern Empire needed to figure out. He adds that her true identity might be revealed if she got involved. However, Anur firmly stated that she swore to protect everyone, not just the Westerners. She turned and mentioned that she would help the other knights and rescue civilians, adding that she had something she needed to check as well. On the other side of the Colosseum, some knights tried to help Edward, advising him to leave as soon as possible. Undeterred, Edward ordered them to go and save Anur, insisting that her life was more important than his, and instructing them to hurry and find her. Just then, Anur arrived at the scene, and Edward quickly approached her, expressing his relief that she was fine. Anur asked if she could help him in any way, but he told her that he came there to protect her. Anur stayed silent for a moment, while Edward imagined how amazing he must look in front of her. Anur then firmly told Edward to get a grip. Shocked, he asked for more clarification. Anur explained that if he was truly the crown prince, who would oversee the future of this nation, he should help those who needed him the most at this time, not her. Edward was completely shocked upon hearing her words. Just then, the knights approached from behind, urging him to escape. However, Edward seemed to be in deep contemplation. He already knew that everyone thought he was pathetic. People said nice things to him, but they were nobles who merely wanted to use his status and influence. He wanted to change too. He wanted to become a proud crown prince who wasn't a fool everyone could use, but he had no idea what he had to do to earn the attention of others. He wondered what it meant to act like a crown prince and hoped someone could teach him, as no one had ever guided him. Suddenly, he remembered what Anur had told him just a moment ago. She was the first person who saw him for who he was, not for his status or influence. She blatantly told him what he needed to hear the most. Edward told the knights that he could not leave when there were still people here. He quickly instructed the guards to get two of the fastest knights to find an exit. As for the rest, he ordered them to gather the knights and those who looked relatively injured there, and he will rescue those who stuck under the debris. He realized that it was all thanks to Anur that he came to his senses, and from now on, he would make sure to become someone who deserved his titles. Meanwhile, Cassian asked the butler if this was part of his plan. The butler revealed that a gorgeous lady with platinum blonde hair and an older gentleman had come to meet the emperor, stating they were there to prevent Juliana from winning the competition. Cassian asked if there was anything else, to which the butler admitted he had done some background checks on both individuals but failed to determine where they were from. Just then, Rashalis approached Cassian from behind and urged him to move to a safer place. The butler intervened, asking what about the Grand Duchess? Cassian smiled and remarked that she would be fine, as this wasn't something she couldn't handle. He then mused if he should bring him here. On the other side, the emperor was getting angry at the old man, demanding that he take responsibility for the chaos. The old man calmly replied that the emperor had hired them in the first place and they were merely following orders to stop Juliana from winning the competition. The emperor, enraged, asked if the old man thought he could get away with this. In response, the old man called for the bandaged man, revealing his name as Jack. With a single slash of his sword, Jack took down all the emperor's knights. The emperor was shocked by the swift and deadly display. However, the old man reassured him not to worry promising that they would not harm him if he remained calm. The old man then began to laugh hysterically, watching the destruction taking place in the Colosseum. He realized that it was time for his great mission to be accomplished. The scene then shifts to Rosanna, who asked Haley if she heard noises coming from the Colosseum. Haley, unfazed, told her they were almost there. Suddenly, a dark aura approached Rosanna from behind and consumed her entire body. 
She pleaded with Haley to save her, but this made woman, in response, thanked Rosanna, mentioning that she was indeed her closest friend. Just then, the doctor arrived at the scene and remarked that it was an excellent ingredient. Haley got near her and asked if this meant she could become the Grand Duchess. The doctor replied in the affirmative, stating that now even the Grand Duchess of Tehran Eugene would not be able to survive the night. Meanwhile, Anur realized that this wasn't just a typical terrorist attack. The thick and disturbing aura mixed in the explosion seemed like black magic, which had been banned for a long time due to its vitality to manifest its power. She knew she needed to determine the cause of this. Just then, Lionel called Anur from behind and asked what was going on. Before Anur could say anything, another explosion occurred where Lionel was standing. In a flashback, we see Anur as a child, sitting with her uncle. He asked her which is more powerful, the power to destroy or the power to protect all things. Little Anur replied that it's the power to destroy because destroying everything is awesome, making it more powerful. Her uncle began to laugh and gently stroked her head. He explained that the power to destroy is indeed powerful, but leaves behind a barren land where flowers can no longer grow. On the other hand, the power to protect isn't as flamboyant, but it gives many good things in return. Anur asked for more clarification, and her uncle elaborated that things they treasure more than anything, like a place to live and family members they love, are worth protecting. He gave an example, saying that she is someone he treasures. He emphasized that power is a method, not a purpose, and she must find that purpose within herself. He asked again if she would use her power to destroy or to protect. This time, Anur replied that she would use her power to protect. Her uncle hugged her upon hearing this, telling her to remember that both he and she would be forced to make many choices. They would always face unreasonable situations with nothing to their advantage because they want to protect. Yet, they would always end up winning. And once they do, something unimaginably beautiful would await them, making all the unreasonable things they endured worthwhile. Anur asked what that beautiful thing would be. With a bright smile on his face, her uncle replied, everything they love. In the present, Anur saved Lionel from the explosion. He was shocked to see her summoning both of her swords in the open. Anur told him that monsters were emerging from the rubble of the explosion, but Lionel responded that this was a problem for the Northern Empire and that its knights could handle it. Anur thought about the monsters arising from the shadows, recognizing it as a dark magic necromancy spell that mocks the dead. She realized they were not to be taken lightly. Suddenly, she attacked the monsters, while Lionel urged her to stop, reminding her that she had done well hiding her identity until now. He asked if she was sure she wanted others to discover who she really was. Anur silently apologized to Lionel. Before her marriage, the Emperor of the West had instructed her to hide her identity, as the Western and Northern empires were not on the best terms. Revealing herself as a knight could spark rumors of espionage and escalate into an international crisis. In the present, Anur thought that nothing was more important than saving lives. Lionel then shouted at her to at least consider her husband. Suddenly, Anur halted as she noticed Cassian standing a little distance away. Before she could speak, she heard someone pleading for help. Anur quickly approached the woman and dispatched the monsters, saving her from imminent death. Turning towards Cassian, she realized things couldn't remain the same now that he had seen her swords. She apologized to Cassian and asked if he could divorce her, explaining that their marriage was never meant to last more than three months. Though it had lasted longer than expected, Cassian told her he couldn't care less about that. Anur persisted, saying she had lied to him and mentioning how the Northern Empire would treat her once her identity was revealed. That's it for today's video. The next one will be arriving in two weeks, and it will hopefully mark the end of this manhwa. So stay tuned for any updates, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.